I want to welcome those who have joined us online. I want to welcome uh, those that are in their homes. And please uh, get over your illness, get over your sickness. We need you in the house. Amen? Yeah. Amen. But I want to welcome you, those of you who are watching online, and also those that are at the Lopez unit and at the detention center. Thank you for joining us online. And those in the house, glad to have you. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Are you glad to be here? I, I don't think you're excited enough to be here. Are you glad to be here? All right. We don't want the people online to think there's just one or two of you. But we want them to know that you have come out today because you want to receive from God. Yeah. Amen. So let us open up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come asking in the word that we hear today that we will recognize our need for the Holy Spirit. Lord, we know that he is our seal, he's our teacher, and he is the power. Some of us sitting here, Lord, need to be reintroduced to him, but some of us need to be introduced to him for the first time. Lord, help us to get understanding about that third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Open up our minds and our hearts to receive your word. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, amen, amen, amen. As you know, we have been in a series, and in this six-week series, and we, this is week number three, and in this series we have been talking about me, we, and them. Me, we, and them. And so the whole idea is, what do me or what do I have to do with the things of God and what is it that God want in my life in order that I can effectively be a part of my community that is here? So what needs to be straightened out in me or what needs to be corrected in me or what needs to be done in me? And so that's what we've been talking about. Pastor David did a dynamic sermon on repentance and people got right with Jesus. They said, you know what? I thought I had repented, but you know what? I had some homework that needed to get done. And they got that done. And then to back that up, Pastor Sell came with a mighty strong word on Mother's Day. Woo! And somebody getting excited over here. Save some of that excitement for when I preach. <laughs> but she came with a dynamic word talking about value. And many times when you go to a church and you hear a service or a sermon on Mother's Day, you think, oh, they're just talking to the ladies. But I tell you, there was some conviction that rose up within me. And I said, wait a minute, I'm not supposed to feel this way today. This is for the women, not me. But there was a great word that talked about value. And so we have been doing these, uh, these six weeks, but it's all about bringing strength to your home. And we also have backed that up with devotions that we have online that our expectation as your pastors and as your church family, our expectation is for you to take those devotions and take the sermons, listen to them again, and then speak to your family. Because we're trying to move families forward, not just individuals, but in moving families forward to say, what is the foundation that we need in our home if we're going to be people of God? And if we're going to make an impact to the rest of our family and on our block, then what is it that I need in me in order to make that happen? And so we, this is the, the purpose. It wasn't just that we sat down and said, okay, can we do a series? What should we talk about, you know? It has to do with you and your life and to say, where do they go from here? Where do they go from here? Romans chapter 8 is the chapter and verses that we've been looking at is 14 to 17 and it is for all who are led by the spirit of God are children of God so you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves instead you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children now we call him Abba father for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we, are sh if we share his glory, we share in his suffering. 
And I, I love the way that started out in the verse number 14. It says, for all who are led by the Spirit, all who are led by the Spirit are the children of God. In other words, if we allow God's Spirit to lead us, then we are the children of God. Those who are not being led by the Spirit of God, we don't expect them to call themselves children of God. But those that are in the house who say, I am a Christian, I am a born-again Christian, and God's Spirit is in me, there's an expectation for them to know who they are. And also those that are at home. If you're saying, I am in Christ's likeness, then there's an expectation for me to be led by the Spirit, to walk in step with the Spirit. I love how Paul says that, that we are to keep in step with the Spirit. In other words, if we keep in step with the Spirit, it's not us that are leading the Holy Spirit, but it's He who is leading us. And we, His family, need to keep in step with Him. So those who are led by the Spirit are the children of God. So you have to, and you know that we have received this spirit the way that verse number 15 says. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves, but we have received a spirit from God, that spirit of adoption, that spirit that brings us into the family of God. Now, some of us don't understand what it means to be adopted because we were born into a family. But you ask someone who has been adopted and what it means to them. And they will tell you it's a different kind of love because that family that I have been adopted into didn't have to choose me, didn't have to take me. And we, who are the adopted children of God, he could have said no. But he has engrafted us. He has brought us in. He has adopted us as his children. We are not illegitimate children. But some of us act that way when we're walking about this earth. We act like we don't belong to God at all. But we have been adopted by him and he has brought us into his family. And we can call him Abba Father. We can call him Dad. We can call him Daddy God because of the relationship that we have in him and with him. Amen? <clears throat> I was reading, and it says 10% of the, those that are in the United States have some type of phobia, some type of a fear. But we, the children of God, don't have to have any fear whatsoever because of the spirit who is in us. Our spirit has joined to his spirit, and he has adopted us, and therefore we have nothing to be afraid of, and we have nothing to step back from, but we should be people who are stepping forward because of the power of God who is in us, the spirit of God who is in us. And this morning, what I'm going to be talking to you about is the Holy Spirit. This is the next lesson in the series that we have, the Holy Spirit. And if you're looking for a title, the title of this message is More Than a Comforter. More Than a Comforter. Now, how many of you like to go shopping, grocery shopping? How many like to go grocery shopping? I don't mind going grocery shopping if I don't have to have a list. If I can just walk the aisle and get whatever I need to get, I'm okay. But you know what? I married someone <laughs> who loves to give me a list. And even if I accidentally, yeah, leave it on the counter at home, she will text it to me. Here's your list. And I will go through and I get everything on the list and then come home and she'll say, well, where's the bread? Well, it wasn't on the list. Pull it up. I went line by line, item by item. How did I miss that? Sometimes we feel that things are not important on the list or we just go right past it. We don't even see it. So either we miss it or we don't think it belongs on the list. Well, some people are like that when it comes to the Holy Spirit. They think, well, I don't need it. And they say it. I don't need it. But I don't think God provided the third person of the Trinity if we didn't need him. 
He's on the list. I've read the word. He's on the list. And there is purpose for him to be on the list. There is purpose for him to be in your life. God placed him on the list. And I have one simple question. If the disciples needed the Holy Spirit, do we need him? Let me go one further with you. If Jesus needed the Holy Spirit, who are we to say we don't need him? He said, I'm sending you another comforter. And I even hear people say, well, you know what? I don't, need, I don't even need church. I don't even need to go to church. I do all right on my own. And I've talked to several people, and that's not working for them. We need church. We need the Holy Spirit. It always shows their credentials. I call it the God credentials. Let me see your God credentials when they say things like that. Because I know that they're not mature in Christ when they say things like that. I know they're not mature in the word when they say things like that. I don't need him in my life. Because we all need him. And it's easy for some people to accept the Father and the Son. But when it comes to the Holy Spirit, they have this idea that, well, maybe this is something mystical. I, I think they've seen too much television like Casper. They think of the Holy Ghost or they think of the uh, Holy Spirit as that ghost, that friendly ghost. Well, I want to say that there's a friendly aspect to him if you know him. There's a friendly aspect to him if you allow him to do what he wants to do in your life. Amen. I, I uh, not long ago, bought some craftsman screwdrivers. A set. Because I felt, okay, I, am, I have a house and I'm a man and there are things that I need to <laughs> do in that house. So therefore, I'm going to get this craftsman set of screwdrivers. And so I open them up and all proud and everything because they're, they're not like from the dollar store. They were craftsmen. <laughs> so I open them up and I'm all proud. And then I see three screwdrivers in there that have a star shape. Like, I don't need these. I've never used these before. I said, ah, but I'll put them in the drawer anyhow. And I put them in the drawer. And one day I was doing something in the car on the side of the door. And guess what? There was a star. I'm like, I've never seen this before. So I had to go into the house. And then I had to search for these star screwdrivers because I thought I didn't need them. But then there came a day and I needed those screwdrivers, so I had to go searching for them. And some of us are like this when it comes to the Holy Spirit, in the sense that we think we don't need them. And then all of a sudden, something happens in our lives. And then all of a sudden, we say, where is the Holy Spirit? I need him to work on this issue, this problem that I'm going through right now. Heavenly Father, I need that spirit that you said is a comforter. I need comforting right now. I'm going through something, and I need your spirit to get me through it. Lord, I know I can't do this on my own. I need you to embark in this situation to do something in this situation that I find myself in. Lord, move by your spirit. Someone that I thought I didn't need until a circumstance came and I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that I needed him. That's who we are. He's more than a comforter. He's the seal of our salvation. He's the teacher that directs us in the journey. He's the empowerment of our witness. And so we have to recognize who the person of the Holy Spirit is. He is not an it. Some people say, well, it's it, 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 it. He is not an it. He is a personality. He's the third person in the Trinity. When God said, let us make man in our own image, he was there. When the Spirit of God moved upon the globe of the earth and they began to separate things, he was there. He's the third person of the Godhead. And so we need to recognize him as that. Sometimes when I see people who say, well, I don't, we don't, I don't think we, I, we, we really don't need the Holy Spirit, you know, because the, and, and the devil tells people this. You know, when, when the church was coming together, the disciples needed the Holy Spirit in order to form the church. So, therefore, we don't need him today. And, and I tell individuals when they tell me that, I say, you know what? That's like a person walking around 
in a hospital gown thinking they're <laughs> fully dressed. Right. Right. <laughs> and it's not until they turn around <laughs> that they realize they're exposed. They're not covered. That's what it's like when we walk around thinking that we don't need the Holy Spirit. We're exposed. We're not fully covered. God has given us the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, that we will be fully covered in this walk that he has called us into. He has adopted us into his family, and he has a work and a job for us to do. And in order for us to accomplish that, we need the Holy Spirit. It is not something or someone that we can put on a shelf and say, until a day comes, then I'll grab him. It is not that way. What happened with the disciples? When Jesus was there, he was their comfort. They felt comfortable as long as Jesus was around. Jesus did the healings. He preached the sermons, fed the multitudes. Everything that was needed to be done, Jesus was right there to do it. But then there came a time... The crucifixion, Jesus was gone. He was not there. And sometimes we feel that way in our lives. Where is he? It doesn't feel like he's here. We're on this side of the crucifixion. We're on this side of the resurrection. But sometimes we act like the disciples who are on the other side. How did they act? How did they act? Let us turn to John chapter 20. John chapter 20, verse 19. Because when Jesus was gone, their life changed. When Jesus was crucified, their life changed. He was put in a tomb, their life changed. What did they do? They ran and hid. They ran and hid. As long as Jesus was there, they were ready to take ground. Oh, it's Romans? Hey, we'll, we'll take them. They went looking for a fight because Jesus was with them. But when he was gone, they went and hid in a locked room. After they had heard everything that he had said, they're in a locked room. John chapter 20, it says, That evening, that Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors. Why? Because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Afraid. Fear. Fear will cause you to make bad decisions. Fear will cause you to not rely on the Holy Spirit. Fear will cause you to be easily manipulated. Fear will cause a multiple th of things in your life if you're not relying on the Holy Spirit. And the enemy will always, always, always try to bring fear and doubt into your life. It worked in the garden, and he's been using the same tactic ever since. And it will work in your life if you don't allow the Holy Spirit in to do what he needs to do. The Jewish leaders, they knew that if we get rid of this man, Jesus, the rest of them will run and they will hide. And it was true. They will run and hide, and we won't have any more problems. They will disband, and it will be over. But the word of God, and I love the impact of this next word. It says, suddenly, suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Can you imagine? They're all in this room, and they're scared to death. And all of a sudden, suddenly, Jesus appears in the room because they're looking out, wondering, when are they going to come after us? And all of a sudden, there is Jesus standing in the room. They're like, wait a minute, how did this person get in here? Who is this? And then all of a sudden, the word says, they began and they saw. They were filled with joy because they said, okay, here's Jesus. He began to show them, as the word says, he began to show them the wounds that he had and the wound in his side. And then all of a sudden, they began to be filled with what? Filled with joy. Because they're thinking in their mind, we're going to continue where we, where we left off. Because he's here now. And I love this next word. It says, when they saw, and this word saw means they perceived, not just seeing with their eyes, but perceiving with their heart. 
they begin to realize this is Jesus. This is the one that we have given our lives for. He is back. Now things are going to get started now. But again, he said to them, peace, be still. The first peace, be still, was to calm them down. Because they were wondering, okay, what's going on here? The second, peace, be still. He had an expectation. And it said, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Amen. Profound. The room begins to change because now he's sending them. And it says, then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now this is when the disciples became Christians. This is when the disciples were adopted into the family of God. They received the Holy Spirit. They became a part of the family of God. They were sealed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the seal of our salvation. And I don't know why people who are saved have the idea that I'm wondering if I'm saved. Well, I feel like I'm not saved. My emotions tell me, the situation, the circumstance tells me that I must not be saved. Well, did you come down to an altar and accept Jesus Christ into your heart? Yes. Well, then what is this emotion thing that you're talking about? Either you believe your emotions or you believe the Word of God. If the Word of God says you invite him into your heart, he comes into your heart, then that's the truth. What you're feeling in your emotion probably is the pizza that you ate last night. <laughs> or the enemy talking to you, trying to bring doubt into your mind to say that you're not really saved. You just said some word. But I want to tell you that God is true to his word. And when you invited him into your life, he came into your life as the word says. The Holy Spirit came into you as a result of you asking Jesus into your heart. The third person of the Trinity lives in you. Yes. Now, the problem is that even though the third person of the Trinity lives in us, we don't act like it. Because we don't have the full knowledge of the Word of God to say who He is and what He's supposed to accomplish in our lives. Many of us, the problems that we have are not necessarily brought into our path by us. Some of those problems that we have are brought into our path by an enemy who wants to kill, steal, and destroy us or by family members. <laughs> You can overcome everything that the enemy throws at you with the help of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let me say that again. You can overcome everything that the enemy throws at you with the help of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, Pastor Carl, my aunt died of cancer, so I thought you said we can overcome. Is she in Christ? Yes. So did you pray for her? Yes. Did God answer the prayer the way you wanted it answered? No. So because God didn't answer the prayer the way you wanted him to answer, then God can't control or do everything. And then you get that look, that blank stare. At them. Well, because we think God is like Santa Claus, that if I pray this way and that way, then God is going to do it exactly that way. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, what did he say? Not my will, but thy will be done. So when we pray and we ask God for things, it's not, Lord, do this according to my expectation. Make a left turn, make a right turn, exactly, and then we will arrive exactly where I want to arrive. But, Lord, let thy will be done. It is in his word to heal. Paul said, I asked, what, three times. And what was the answer? My grace is sufficient. But today Paul is healed. You may be going through a sickness. Pray with all that is within you. Allow your faith to rise up within you. And you speak as to God as if it is done. And watch it be done according to his will, according to his word. But there will be an enemy that will come alongside of you and whisper in your ear to say that, oh, God is not listening to your prayer. It's your action. It's your attitude. It's this. Try to give you all excuses why God is not acting the way you want God to act in your life. It's not according to what you want, but according to him. 
You are sealed by the Holy Spirit when you ask him into your life. Many times we, in, been, in being given the Holy Spirit, we've been given something that we don't understand because we don't get into the Word of God to find out who he is. Therefore, we continue to walk around with ignorance, not knowing who the Holy Spirit is. But God says, get in the Word, get in the Word, get in the Word. Understand who I am as your Father. Understand who I am as your Spirit. Understand who I am as the Son. Three in one. That's our God. And we are to understand who they are. <clears throat> the problem that we have is many of us are still dominated by the same spirit that was there before we came to Christ. Well, what do you mean by that? Let's look at Romans chapter 8, verse number 5 and 6. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. So the bottom line is, who are you going to be controlled by? Who are you going to let direct your mind, direct your thinking, direct your life? It needs to be the Holy Spirit. Because that's why the Comforter is there, to direct you, to lead you, not to be put on a shelf. So if that Spirit is still dominating your life, you need to do an assessment to say, What's going on? Do I have my ear to the Holy Spirit? Or do I have my ear to the world? Because God says, I am sending you. And as a result of sending you, he's not sending you without something to do the battle with. But there's a choice that is involved in this. A choice that you have. And you have to enact that choice. Well, do I really want to change do I really want these things to happen in my life? Well, you know what, Pastor Carl? I came to church today. I came down to the altar. And you know what? God got a hold of my life. And I'm a changed person. I am not going to be the same. I mean, you've heard this. I am not going to be the same from this day forward. In fact, I'm going home right now. I'm going to take all my drug paraphernalia and my drugs, and I'm going to put them in a shoebox. I'm going to put them in the closet. And I am not doing drugs anymore. But I still have my dealer on my speed dial. I still have the drugs up in the closet. My Bible says, says make no provision for sin. If I want to be dominated by the Holy Spirit, then I move those things out of the reach of my flesh. Because my flesh is going to get to the point and reach for those things if it's available. If I have a bad relationship and I allow that relationship to continue to stay in my life, that relationship, one of these days, I'm going to reach and grab it. Whereas those who are dominated by the Spirit need to walk in step with that Spirit. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit. And where is the spirit? It is in our hearts as a guarantee. In other words, God gave us the Holy Spirit as a down payment as to where we're going. The Holy Spirit has been given to you because you're on your way to heaven as a part of the family of God. And it's not according to how I feel as to whether or not that Holy Spirit is there, but it's because of the Word of God that that Holy Spirit is in my life. I invited Him in my life. I walk with Him in my life. Everywhere I go, the Holy Spirit is in me. Whether I want to act like it or not, He is in me. So I can come into a building like this and I can hear the Word and sing the song, but if I'm still dominated by the same Spirit who was there prior to me getting saved, there is no change that is going to come about in my life. It's all about choice. So I can leave here right now and I can do exploits for God or I can leave here right now and continue to do whatever I did for the devil. 
The Holy Spirit is in you because you're saved. But the Holy Spirit is available to you as a direction and as a teacher. But we grieve him every day by not making the choice to let him be dominant in our life. He has been sent as a teacher to be in our lives. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 30 it says, And do not bring sorrow or grieve the Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness. Well, how do I get rid of all this bitterness? How do I get rid of all this rage? By allowing the Holy Spirit to teach you how to do that. It's not under your own power, under your own direction, but it's by the direction of the Holy Spirit teaching you. Verse 31, it says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. In other words, just what God did in my life, I'm to do in other people's lives also. How can I do that? Not because I love you, not because I care about you, but it's because of the Christ Spirit who is in me that enables me to do that. So it's not under my own strength that I am able to embrace you and say, I forgive you, but it's because of the power of God who is in me, the teacher who is in me, that shows me the steps that I need to make in order to make you a part of the family of God, keep you as a part of the family of God, treat you like a part of the family of God, because the Holy Spirit in me enables me to do that. Amen. There are people in your natural family that some of you hate, but that is the flesh that is allowing you to treat them that way and act that way. But as you allow the Holy Spirit to begin to roll around within you, begin to teach you and talk to you and speak to you in the stillness of the night or in the part of the midday, as the Holy Spirit begins to talk to you, all of a sudden change begins to happen in your life. Why? Because of the God who is in you, not dormant. Some of us, the Holy Spirit is just sitting back saying, I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting. God says, I've given you a teacher. Right. Jesus could be in one place at one time. The Holy Spirit can be all over the globe at one point in time. And Jesus said, it's better for you that I go and send him. That's why. The Holy Spirit brings multiplication to the family of God. Amen. He's multiplied the power of God. Just in this room, imagine what God can do as a result of his Holy Spirit. That's why he gave us the Holy Spirit, for what he has called us to do. And the Holy Spirit teaches us. Remember John chapter 3 and verse number 1? It says, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, teacher, we know that you are a teacher come from God. No one can do these things or do these signs that you do unless God is with him. The things that God wants to do in your family, he wants your family, your extended family, the people at your job, he wants them to marvel and say to you, God must be with you. You must be a teacher because no one can do what you're doing. No one can do what you're doing unless God be with them. So as, as we're listening to the Holy Spirit and as he's teaching us and directing us, we're able to do great things for God and people will stand back and marvel because we, the family of God, the people of God, are able to do marvelous miracles. Why? Not because of who we are but because of who he is, and we allow him to do those things through our lives as we listen to the Holy Spirit. He is the great teacher that God has given to us, and we need to utilize that teacher that is there. But he's not just a teacher. He's not just a comforter. He is the power that God has given to us. Sometimes we treat the Holy Spirit like a substitute teacher. The regular teacher's not here, so we can do whatever we want. <laughs> He's not a substitute. He is the teacher. Amen. Yes. Teaching you how to be Christ-like. Right. 
teaching you to do the same things that Christ did when he was here. Remember the story, I think it's in Luke 9, where when Jesus sent out the 12, and then he sent out the 72, and they came back all excited. Oh, you know what? We cast out demons, we healed, and everything was going on, and they were excited. He said, don't, be mar don't marvel over the fact that you were able to do these things. Be marveled over the idea that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. So don't get caught up with the things that you are able to do as a result of the Spirit of God is in you, but be more excited that your name is written and that you do have that Spirit in you. They got a little taste of what we're able to live like every day. Because Jesus gave them the authority to do that at that moment. But then there came another time and he gave them the authority to continue on. Some of us, we don't do what the teacher tells us to do because we think we can do better. Proverbs chapter three, verses five and six. What does it say? Trust in your own intellect, trust in what you think is in your heart, Oh, oh, that's not what it says, is it? <laughs> it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all that you do. And he will show you, he will direct your path and tell you which path to take. If we allow this spirit who is in us, if we, if we tune our ear to really hear what God wants to say, he will direct us through the Holy Spirit. Not on our own understanding, but listening to him. I, I know people that have done marvelous things in the family of God, in the ministry, in business, and all kinds of different things. Why? Because they listen to the Holy Spirit. God will direct you. He is the power. The Holy Spirit is the power. Now, if I, I have a power saw at home. I don't use it, but I have one. <laughs> I bought it so that I could use it. But if I was to bring my power saw over to your house and you had a plank of wood and I took the power saw and went, <laughs> you would say, there's a problem with this guy. <laughs> There's a problem with this guy. He has a power saw. And you would even say to me, why don't you plug it in? The same thing that happens in our lives. God has given us a power. And he is telling us, the church today, we need to plug into the power, the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to plug into what God has enabled us and given to us as a gift that comes from him. The Holy Spirit is the power of the church. Acts chapter 1, and I'm reading from the Amplified. It says, the first account I made, Theophilus, was a continuous report about all the things that Jesus began to do and teach. And you'll understand why I'm reading this from the Amplified instead of another translation. It says, until, that, until the day when he ascended to heaven, after he had, by the Holy Spirit, given instruction to the apostles, special messengers, whom he had chosen. To these men, he also showed himself alive. That was in the room there, it started. He showed himself alive after his suffering in Gethsemane and on the cross by a series of many infallible proofs and unquestionable demonstrations appearing to them over a period of 40 days and talking to them about the things concerning the kingdom of God. And then I'm going to go down to verse number five, because this is the promise that was sent. He says, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized and empowered and united with the Holy Spirit not long from now. So when they had come together, they, had, they asked for him repeatedly, Lord, are you at this time reestablishing the kingdom and restoring it to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the epics or the time of the day, or the hour, he said, which the Father has fixed on his own authority, but you will receive power and ability 
when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses to tell people about me both in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. In other words, God has given us the availability of a power that we can use that comes from the throne room of heaven into our lives as we invite the Holy Spirit into our lives. Just as we saw with the disciples, it is still ready and available for us today. When we look at the disciples, and we saw the attitude that they had in that locked room. They were scared. They were fearful. They were afraid. They had all kinds of things coming upon them. But then all of a sudden, Jesus came on the scene and he said, go to Jerusalem. Stay there until this power comes upon you. And when this power comes on you, you will be my witness to the uttermost parts of the earth. And that is still the same in our lives today. That power is still available in our lives. By the throne room of God, he has given us the Holy Spirit. Spirit. And as a result of us having the Holy Spirit, we have power in our life. We don't have to be fearful, but we can understand and know that we know who we are as the saved people of God, but we can also do great exploits in being witnesses for God, for who he has called us to be as the people of God. That's who we are. That's who we are. We don't have to be fearful. We don't have to run away from the devil. We run towards the devil because of the power that is in us. When our, someone in our family are saying that I'm having this problem, that problem, we come upon the scene and we tell them, let me tell you what Jesus is telling me through my spirit. Let me tell you as I am a witness of God, of what he has done in my life. I'm a witness to what God can do in your life because there is power in this thing that God has given to us, the people of God. We have to enact that power. It can set dormant in our lives or we can use the power that God has given to us. It is a choice that we make that that power moves in our lives. We have not been called to be a secret society, but we have been called to be on the front line of what God wants to do on this globe. I have Christians who are afraid of their own shadow. But there is a spirit that lives within them that is crying out, saying, listen to the Abba Father. He is speaking to you. Tune your ear to what the spirit has to say. You'll never be the same if you listen. You'll never be the same. There's a power source that is available. There's a teacher that is available, that has been given to us. Not for our own selfish reasons, but for a godly reason. Let us pray. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, you said you would build your church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. You've given us the power source to build your church. You've given us the teacher to build your church. You have sealed us to build your church. Now, Lord, may we step forward and build your church. Lord, we thank you for meeting us here today. We thank you for moving by your spirit. We thank you for not allowing us to stay comfortable. Lord, we repent afresh. Lord, you brought value to us for a purpose. Lord, you've given us your Holy Spirit for a purpose. If you're in this room and you would say, Pastor Carl, I don't know this Jesus that you're talking about. And I'm asking that all heads be bowed and all eyes closed. But you would say, I need to know this Jesus that you're talking about. I need to know him. I need to invite him in my life. I've lived my life and I've made a mess of it. Now it's time to give Jesus a chance. 
If that is you, all heads bowed, all eyes closed, just raise your hand right there where you are and say, pray for me. Pray for me. I need this Jesus in my life. Amen. Amen. Any others? Leave it there that I might see it. Yes, I see that hand. Others. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. 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 This is what it's all about. This is what coming into this room is all about. Getting it right with Jesus. And if there are those of you who are at home, you have your hand raised also. I need to invite Jesus into my life. I need that power of the Holy Spirit working in me, directing me, teaching me, showing me. I so need him. In a few moments, we're going to pray, and I'm going to ask everyone in the congregation to pray along with you. And those of you who are at home, I'm going to ask you to pray also. And there are those of you who are here today who have not been making the decision to allow the Holy Spirit to teach, to direct. For yours is a moment of repentance from the perspective of saying, God, I give you the opportunity to lead and to direct. Let us pray all together. Dear Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me for my sins. I repent. And I ask you to direct my life from this day forward. I ask that your Holy Spirit will reside in me and cause this greatness that I have heard about, I've read about. And from this day forward, I know I will never be the same because you're true to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God keep you.